called him in. He was settling debts. This man was brought before him that owed, owed excuse me, a great sum. In fact, that sum is larger than could ever be repaid. And, and, and he uh, falls down before him. He prostrates himself before his, his uh, master. He says, I will repay you. Just simply give me time. And then moved by that, his master, not, I think this is important, not, not just grants him time, not, just doesn't give him what he wants, but relieves him of the debt. He cancels that debt. And so this is, this is huge. And sometimes I think we, we uh, forget about the magnitude of that forgiveness. And, and you and I, if we look at this in spiritual terms, uh, so many times we, we come and, of course, there's, there's repentance, right? There's confession. And we're going to turn around and we're going we're gonna to almost, in some effect, start a payback. Well, that's not really what happens. We are forgiven. We are, we are uh, uh, relieved of that spiritual debt. And, uh, and, and we start anew. And we start anew with, with being a, a, a washed by Christ's blood, which now is a tremendous uh, thing for you and I going forward. And so uh, the occasion is that the man goes out, finds a fellow slave uh, that owed him a sum. Remember, this sum is it's not inconsequential. It, it's like 100 days wages or whatever. So even to Jesus' audience, this is, this is the sum of money. But the idea is, in comparison, it really is so finite. Uh, and he, you know, in verse 28, uh, begins to choke him and say, pay back what you owe. And his fellow slave uh, uh, fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me, and I will repay you, basically, word for word, his reaction to his master a few moments ago, literally moments ago. And yet, what is the result? But he was unwilling and went through him into prison until he should pay back what was owed, verse 30. And so he, he put him into prison. Now some, I, I mentioned this last week, argued that it wasn't possible for one slave to put another slave or one servant, another servant, into prison. That was, you couldn't do that in that society. I don't know if that's the case or not, but the parable, of course, seeking to show us the improper attitude or the the, the, the misguided character of this individual could very easily say that's what happened to show us or be shocking to us. Uh, and, of course, the ultimate thing is, or, or what we had talked about last week is, um, one putting another in prison, now he no longer could work to pay that back. Uh, he, he would have to find other means, or his family would to pay him back. Uh, but this is a situation where in in view of what we do with one another when forgiveness is asked for, do we withhold forgiveness? So do, we, do we not allow repayment, if you will? Uh, somebody comes to us and they say they're sorry. And, and maybe this has happened again and again. And now we're like, no. Or, or we simply give it lip service and we don't actually forgive. Um, are we stifling others' service to God when we do that? I, I, we talked about that a fair bit. I, I think the question or the answer would certainly be yes. Uh, do we do this out of position? The idea of one servant to another. We certainly do. And of course that's in the context and we know the ending of the story here. Uh, my heavenly father will also do you, verse 35, if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Uh, when we think about what God has done, the forgiveness that he has provided for us in sending his only son uh, to, to live uh, a life in human flesh, uh, sinless, to become that perfect lamb of salvation for you and I, forgives us of our sins when we come to him, put his son on in baptism, and, and we're now clothed with him, where his blood continually washes over us, and yet we do not forgive our brother, which from God's perspective is something he desires for us. He desires it for our brother that's wronged us. He desires it uh, for, for us to, to what? To be more relatable to him. I mean, why, why do we have suffering in this world? Well, his son suffered for us. He suffered a great deal. And when we suffer, we become more like him. We become more relatable to him. And, and of course, forgiveness would be in the same, would be in the same type of thread. So do we stifle others' service to God when we do not forgive them? When we don't allow them payback, if you will, according to the, 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 the parable. 
we paralyze ourselves from service as we condemn a brother or sister as well. If we're unwilling to forgive as, as we are commanded to do so here, who are we ultimately hurting? We're hurting ourselves. We, we, we are going to, we are going to um, have an adverse effect on our own, on our own life. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different comparisons about this. You know, if you, if you bring an animal home, certain pet home, and you, let's say it's the type of pet that you would put in a cage, uh, how can you create that animal from not, or how can you cause that animal to not grow physically to its potential? You put it in a smaller container, right? You, you keep the cage small. If you, if you make it bigger, some of these animals will, will eat more, do more, exercise more, they will grow to their potential. Well, is that really not what we do? When we refuse to forgive a brother or sister, we, we are stifling our own growth. We, are, we are, are hindering our own expansion, if you will. Any thoughts about verse 30? I know that's kind of where we left off last week and spent some time there. In verse 31, uh, we read, And so when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord what all that had happened. Uh, of course, in, in, in the uh, parable, which is dealing with physical reality, the, the master is told. Um, God does not need to be told of our shortcomings. God knows uh, when, we, when we have made mistakes. Um, and yet... Uh, our fellow slaves or servants, if you will, our, our um, fellow Christians are going to have a reaction to our, our dealings, our dealings with one another. And it says that these individuals were deeply grieved, or some of your versions read saddened. Um, so as a parable reads, that would be the correct response. There's, there's uh, every indication is uh, from the parable that Jesus is saying here that that, that is a correct response. They were grieved. Uh, we, we mentioned that anger would maybe be the first response that some of us would have. <coughs> and, and is probably, uh, I mean, it's something that would not seem out of line by this. If we've seen uh, one of our, our fellow servants go through this, released of a grand debt, and then go and mistreat a fellow brother, we may be angered. Um, and, and, and that's it is an unfortunate thing. In Romans chapter 12, verse 19, it says, Never take your own vengeance, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. We're going to come to another verse later on today. It talks about, Do not let the sun set on your anger. Even righteous anger has what seems to be a time period associated with. Now, I know that Jesus became... Um, uh, uh, we know that Jesus did not sin, and yet when he turned over the money changers' tables, we say, well, there's a good example of a righteous anger. Yeah, um, Jesus was reacting to something happening in his father's house, too. And he is, he is intimately involved in that reaction a little more than you and I are in the actions that we deal with, I'm afraid. So I, I don't know that I'm going to... Um, uh, be angry indefinitely and point back to Jesus turning over the tables. I'm not sure I can do that when I consider other scripture. Can we have a righteous anger? Yes, I believe we can. But notice these individuals here are saddened. And that, truthfully, when, when we consider what's missing in this individual, how he's hurting his fellow brother, uh, sadness here definitely seems to be the correct uh, feeling that, that uh, his fellow servants can have. Any thoughts on verse 31? I think it's just yeah. funny to point out that the natural response is, is outrage. From, it's like everyone saw it with that one person. I think sometimes we can be this wicked servant, so to speak, in our in our thinking sometimes, where even everyone around us could very easily see like why are you not forgiving this person or whatever the case may be. Yeah. But sometimes we don't have the foresight to have it in our perspective. Um, Ephesians 4 verse 26 says, be angry and do not sin. So we, we, we can have a righteous anger. 
Um, now in this situation, uh, we just mentioned that, that uh, they went to the master with this. Well, we as well can go to the master. Now he, he knows what's going on. He knows far better than we do. He can see the hearts of each individual involved. But when we're saddened by something like this, uh, the perfect place to take that is to the master. And we do that in prayer. We can simply pray for a situation like that. And, of course, we can look at passages that tell us that the effective prayer or the prayer of, uh, of such an individual will, will be beneficial. And so, um, this so often is a time uh, we fret about things. We, we, are, we are emotional about things. Well, let's, let's leave that to God or let's give that to God and ask him. Uh, to deal with that, let's let's uh, include him in our in our consciousness of what we see, of what is going on. And the thoughts of verse thirty-one, verse thirty-two. Then summoning him, his lord said to him, "You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me." <coughs> verse thirty-two is talking about that pleading is uh, desiredest me or entreateth me. Uh, the Greek means to besought. The master had forgiven him everything and, again, more than he had asked for. He, he did not take him up on repayment. He said, I'm going to forgive him or relieve you of that debt. But the reasoning here is that, that he did that is that he desired him or he entreated him. He besought him. He, he, he pleaded directly to him. And, and the master was moved. He, he allowed his, his plea uh, the, the, the greatest of measure, and, and he forgave <coughs> him that debt. Um, so so it, it, it's, a, it's a big thing. Any thoughts there in verse 32? Verse 33. Uh, Shouldest you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in that same way that I had mercy on you? Uh, and so he... he he puts it out there as to um, what he should have done. Uh, th this is, re again, remember, uh, reminiscent of, of what we call the Lord's Prayer, that example uh, that Jesus gave his disciples. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Um, as he said here, even as I had pity on thee. So that would be the attitude that he would take out to his brother. Uh, and, and notice that we have to do more than forgive. Uh, not just allow repayment, but cancel the debt. And that, that's, that's an extra measure. And so when Peter asked originally, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother when he comes to me? Uh, Peter's mind is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this seven times, but the answer coming back from Jesus is 70 times seven. But then it's not just forgiveness of, uh, or, or the answer of forgiveness, but the act of forgiveness in truly removing or eliminating the debt as the master did. And, and there's, there's cases, I suppose, where you and I are going to ask for forgiveness of one another, that's going to be harder than others. Uh, okay, sometimes we can, we can say, you're forgiven, or I forgive you. And yet, the extra step is where the work is, right? Where, where it's going to cause us um, a greater task, if you will. Yes, Marie. It seems to me, though, that the responsibility here isn't just on the person doing the forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It's on the view of somebody who's asking for the forgiveness mm -hmm. in a deceitful way. Yeah. Because this guy obviously wasn't thankful that he was forgiven. Yeah. For changing his way of life. Yeah. He was using it. You know, it, it looks as though um, when, when um, at the end of verse 32, the master says, I release you of all the debt because you pleaded with me. He came to him with the right spirit. And then his subsequent fellow servant came to him with the right spirit. But his, his, his uh, uh, position here, of course, 
um, shuttering his fellow servant is completely wrong. Uh, but, you, but you're exactly right. We, we have to go to one another in this, in this um, uh, desiredest or entreateth way. We, we, we humbly need to come to one another. Um, and, and I'd like us to get into some passages that talk about uh, the elements of love and the attitude that we need to have with one another. And really, when you start reading those passages... And, and you start thinking about the, the character that needs to be upon us, it almost becomes difficult to imagine not forgiving or, or being at odds with, an, with another brother or sister. Now, I know there's going to be things. I, I know we're going to have dust-ups or whatever we want to call them. It's going to happen. But if the attitude is correct between both, but that's usually not the issue, is it? Or, or the problem, usually somebody has a lacking character. There's not love involved in, in one aspect or something. Yes, Frank? You know, that illustration probably isn't the best, but I remember years back <clears throat> when I smoked. <clears throat> and many times I said I was going to quit on New Year's Eve. Um, and it came to a point where I always started again. And one night we had joint parents over and his brother and sister, and we were talking scripture and what we had learned about the church. <coughs> and I was talking on a cigarette. <laughs> and after they left, Dwayne said to me, you know, you talk like a hotshot Christian, <laughs> puffing on a cigarette. And that illustration struck me. I, I felt hurt that he said that. Yeah. But <coughs> the reality of it hit me. And I became very serious about it, and immediately, like, that was the last cigarette sure. I smoked. Sure. And so we all got to get to a point where we recognize our guilt right. and what we're doing yeah. and our sincerity in it. Yeah. And we're not fooling anybody. Right. Yeah, and you know, I don't know that your example there is is out of line because uh, that that's something that we we understand is is a habit forming thing. Um, if you are into that, you, your your body. Is, is working against your mind if you want to quit. But that's more powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But there, there's a situation where you could see, um, especially in, in the life of a young Christian or somebody that's, that's, that's starting out, how uh, the Lord's admonition to Peter 70 times 7 is going to be important. Because there will likely be missteps along the way. And, and so from that standpoint, too, I, I think that's a pretty good example. Uh, yes, Pam. I think that's a good example, too, of how, you know, you are supposed to kind of call each other out. Yeah. You know, like, if you don't, you're also hindering something. As rough as it was, as yeah. As rough as it is. Yeah. You don't have to be that harsh about it. But well, maybe, maybe that between, <laughs> maybe that between a, a husband and a wife can happen where it can't happen with somebody else. Uh, but, yeah, you're exactly right. There's, there's a, a call to accountability there. Yeah, yes. Um, I'm just wondering when Peter said um, he said I forgive him seven times. I have reference on here as part of lesson one times. I think it's one three. Yeah. Under the old law, they were to get, forgive or yeah. God forgave three times, and the fourth was you know you're done. Right. So do you think Peter here had like this bringing attention, like well? Yeah. He you know, he was going go, further. Yeah. So Amos one and Amos two both refer to that, and there was there was. See, the Pharisees, being uh, of legalistic mind, were trying to look for the number. And they wanted to forgive their brother up till and then cut him off. And that's how they were living their lives. And that's why they so much um, did not uh, mesh with Jesus when he comes along with a completely different attitude. And of course, we see one of those examples right here with forgiving him 70 times 7. And so while Peter was trying to, trying to look pious or, or very spiritual before Jesus, he was far short too in that he was still saying a number. Where Jesus comes back with 70 times 7 is a real number, and yet it's, 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 it's showing us uh, infinity, if you will. So I'm just trying to think of, okay, so he went from the money, and then he forgave it. Yep. So, but what, what would have happened had he gone out and then three days later he comes back and wants to borrow more money from him? Yeah. Is that forgiveness? I, I mean, he forgave him at that, but did he then be stupid enough to give him more money? Right. And and that that's uh, 
that's something that we would, uh, you know, have to contemplate uh, in, in, the, in the confines of the illustration here. And, you know, I think one of the challenging things with the parables of Jesus is we can, we can beat them to death or we can take them too far. And so there's, there's a physical um, thing that's representing a, a spiritual idea. And so I, I think when you look at, at, at the ideas presented by this, that's a question that's not addressed, okay? It's all about his reaction to his fellow servant based on what God had done for him. Uh, that's the underlying principle, I think, of... of now, you and I, we, we, we would say that, okay? If somebody was um, uh, struggling uh, and forgiven, and then would we enable them in some way to go do that again? Well, there's just some things that aren't smart, right? Uh, there are some sins that have consequences, and right away we would think about, okay, uh, would, would we call it, would we call it uh, guardrails or boundaries or whatever? We we say, look, don't put yourself in this situation. Don't ever get yourself back to where you would make that mistake again with me. Um, that's understandable, but but I, it's not addressed here. I don't believe. I I I, I think we can understand where there'd be cases where we want to do that. And uh, Luke and James, verse 34, yep. says, And his master was angry and delivered him to the torture until he should pay all that was due to him. Yep. Do we know uh, who the torturers are? Let's get to that in just a minute. <laughs> That's a really good question. I'm, I'm headed there. With, with verse 33, though, should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? Kind of finishing up around the slide here. I, I think this is what, what the pastor is primarily talking about. Um, my question to you is, okay, does that mean that, that this comparison towards us, is this wor worthy of imitation? <laughs> or does it put us under obligation to act accordingly. In other words, is this a good is this an example, and by that a good thing for you and I to do, or are we under obligation to forgive in this manner? Exactly right. In, and in fact, I, I would go so far as to say when we do not forgive like we are supposed to or obligated to, I'm not sure we fully understand our own forgiveness. And that was one of the goals of this class was to talk about or to discover the, the um, level of forgiveness that has been given to you and I. And, and so if, if we can't forgive our brother in that way, uh, we are like the servant, extremely short-sighted and not really understanding what we have been given. Not, not, not fully comprehending our own forgiveness from our God. Uh, and so, pretty sobering thought, I think. Yes? Um, I wanted to say that since I have been um, moved from a house to a totally different atmosphere, and it's all seniors. Mm -hmm. uh, that sometimes it is very embarrassing for me to have to answer something that they don't believe in and laugh at me mm -hmm. 
And now, by getting my big mouth going uh, and telling him that I talk with him every day, all day, driving car or whatever, and they look at me and say, hey, you got something there. <laughs> so now there, there are more people that come and sit at my table just to see what I'm going to say if they ask me a question. <laughs> So, uh, when I you're in the vehicle, it. you've got a captive audience. That's, that's a smart <laughs> yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I didn't, really didn't want it. I told the Lord, but if this is where you want me, then you've got to help me. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, look at verse 32 uh, or 33. Uh, Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger. This, um, uh, moved with anger is is uh, wroth or very angry, justly provoked is what this means. His Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all of his own to him. Now this this brings up several questions. So Wayne asked first about the torturers, and this is um, uh, a very real thing. Most uh, financial dealings that would uh, end up in incarceration were uh, civil in nature. This is speaking of criminal. And so Jesus is employing now that there, there was a wrong, but now this is, is a, a compound effect and has now become criminal, and that's where the tortures would be brought into uh, effect. Uh, and the tortures were um, described as jailers or torturers, um, it would include uh, prisoners being examined. Don't you love that word? That means that they were tortured. Uh, and the idea here was is that they were tortured uh, to the point of releasing or um, identifying other assets that they had that could be used as repayment. Uh, so, for example, if, if they, you know, they got the vacation house up north. That's going to come out in torture or the examination and would then be applied to what they owed, yes. But then it seems to me that the proof of forgiveness would come by the behavior of the one that hadn't been forgiven by how he was now acting. If he resorted back to where he had been, mm -hmm. he wasn't deserving of the forgiveness. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think I think that's where he's headed with, with this individual. He he is now going to suffer um, at the torture's hand until payment is made in full. What's unique about that, though, with the torture and the examination is um, they would also do that to compel loved ones to come to the rescue. And so if one um, was from a family that had something, the family then, to save that individual, would liquidate or bring to help cover debt. But in most cases, this examination did not go on forever. And in fact, in, in criminal cases, would end in death. Now, I, I don't know that that was the case at this time, because if you remember, uh, even when talking about Jesus, the Jews could not put Jesus to death. They had to use the Romans to do that. So at times, this was not practiced to the nth degree. But that is something. Uh, or he could be relying on, um, the parable could, could be relying on what they know as common practice in other cultures. That could be the case. So it wouldn't necessarily have to be their own culture. It could be where they see this happening within this group or that group. And it would be known, though. And so a very easy parable or something that would be easily understood would include them knowing how this works. Um, and just so, it, it's not written out, it's not spelled out for us, but it's not good. And what does it relate to? It relates to eternal punishment is what it is. If we withhold, going back to the Lord's Prayer, back to this passage, verse 35, if we withhold complete forgiveness to an individual, we will be withheld from. And, and so God has, has spelled that out. That's his prerogative. He, he can do that. And the reasoning is right here that we should have that spirit of forgiveness as he does. He's asking that of us. So uh, 
Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way I had mercy on you? And the Lord uh, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed to him. Notice, uh, the debt was freely and fully forgiven. He willfully and grievously offended. His pardon was retracted. The whole debt reacquired. The offender uh, uh, delivered to the, the offender, delivered to the torturers forever. What do you think about the, the philosophy of once saved, always saved when you read that? It doesn't work, does it? In fact, that is so inconsistent <coughs> with Scripture that we could go to a dozen different places and see where that does not work. But the man was forgiven a debt, and yet, this goes back to Ray's comment about like three weeks ago, somehow this debt has come back on him. So God forgives, and yet has been reapplied. Now, I'm not sure how this works. I've, I've got some ideas I want to ask you too. But when we think about the doctrine as once saved, always saved, Ah. It, it just doesn't fit in this at all. There's, there's no way uh, that that is the case. And I think we understand it. I, I, I don't think that's a struggle for us to understand. We can obviously see how one can be granted forgiveness and then that be taken away. Now, how does that work? How, how is it that one could, could um, be given a forgiveness and then that apparently be reapplied as, as this passage looks like it does. Um, I guess so many times when we come to something like this, or you know, we think about Jesus when we started this discussion, we talked about how he, he uh, asked that the, the, the sin of, of those around him put him on that cross was not held against them. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, Stephen speaks something very similar as he's being stoned. And yet we know that if those sins are removed from those individuals, they still have sin attached to them. I don't think Jesus' statement about that or, or uh, Stephen's statement about those that were stoning him is going to give passage for those individuals to heaven. It's not the case. They, they are sin, sinful beings yet in other ways. What it may be more so, I think Mark brought this up, is the attitude of the one that's undergoing that persecution. It's almost like Jesus, and I, I think that's really good thought, Jesus had to say that for not only the benefit of those that were standing around listening, but for our benefit as well, to clearly flush out the man that he was, the attitude that was within that body. Now, you and I can hide things from one another. But what Jesus said on the cross under that duress shows us exactly who he was. And, and that is a spirit that, that he asked of us. I guarantee you we're not all going to get there right away. <laughs> that, that's, that's maybe a lifelong challenge, right? To, to come along with the ability to utter words like that. And you and I are not being nailed to a tree, folks. I mean, somebody says a, a cross word about us. I mean, literally, the cut off in traffic thing. <laughs> and we're ready. To... <laughs> I mean, this is such a challenge, right? Uh, so that's, that's, that's something to consider. It's something to think about. So this debt, which seemed to be fully forgiven in verse 27, and the Lord said that slave felt compassion. I mean, release him from that debt. Forgave him the debt. And yet now, uh, his Lord moved with anger in verse 34, handed him over to the churches until he should repay all that was owed him. I, I don't know. His, his wrong now is wrong, wrong. He doesn't have the debt acquired back to him, but it's within the parable here. But he's wrong. And so uh, it only takes one sin. Uh, and yet, what would the difference be? Well, is, is it a, as he goes into this punishment, is, is, is it a stream of consciousness now of what he was forgiven and what he did not forgive? Would that not be torture enough? To know that now you are suffering because you couldn't render a forgiveness that looked like the grand forgiveness you were given? Notice the amounts. You just had a little to forgive. 
and you were given forgiven so much. Is it is it that? Um, because I I think when God forgives sins, they're forgiven. But if something's reapplied to us, it would seem to me that just simply our understanding of what has happened is more than enough. So maybe it's splitting hairs. Maybe it's one way or the other. I don't know. But it would be a rough situation, wouldn't it? To know that you're suffering because you couldn't muster up a little bit of what God has done for you. Uh, that's tough. Anybody, any thoughts on that verse 34? Uh, yeah, Marcia. I guess maybe you could kind of look at it like the check hasn't cleared. It's like the, <laughs> the king paid the debt in a way and forgave it. But then he found out the servant wasn't who he presented himself to be, mm -hmm. a repentant person. Mm -hmm. He was not repentant. And, and he wasn't thankful. And you know, maybe at the outset, when that servant uh, falls down before his master and asks him for forgiveness, has... Has he acquired what the master wants him to yet? Probably not. Now he forgives him that great amount. Has he acquired what the master has asked for him yet? Maybe not. When he's confronted with his fellow servant who owes him something, now is his opportunity, isn't it? You know, we, we are given days, and days and days, they turn into weeks and months and years. And, and, we are going to have a continual growth process. And it's not all going to happen at once. But when presented with the opportunity then, man, that should have been so clear in his mind that I have just received such a gift. And notice he goes right out and has issue with a brother. It's as wrong as wrong gets, isn't it? Notice verse 35. Now, my heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. And this is where we're headed for next week. I'm going to tell you it's not enough to say you're forgiven. God does not do that with us. Our Lord does not so forgive us that way, and neither should we. In other words, just say you're forgiven. It's far deeper than uh, and we are out of time, and we will pick up there next week. Any last thoughts? Okay, thanks for your attention. Okay, so I'm going to go. This is where I got my for going ahead. Second floor. And confidently, the moon itself was a guide to the blind. Yep. Let me go to only one was the left, but he had a problem. He was a he she, and then he had a problem. I was told to ask her, are you a Christian? <laughs> He left the establishment. How my birthday boy do it? Thank you.